Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce Marcia Eddy, who will be telling us about how optimal transport can help us to determine curvature of complex networks. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this invitation and uh, welcome to everybody for joining this seminar today. My name is Marzia A.D. and I'm going to talk about a beautiful journey today uh, from Riemannian uh, geometry to network analysis. I'm a PhD student at Max Planck Institute for Mathematics in the Sciences. And uh, here I'm working under the supervision of Professor Jürgen Joost at MPI. And for all of these uh, works, we have had two main motivations. The first is, uh, uh, what is, I wanted to understand what is the meaning of curvature in discrete settings. Because when we talk about complex networks and data in general, they are usually discrete. But what does it mean to assign a uh, discrete, uh, to assign a curvature notion to a discrete setting, such as graphs, for instance? On the other side, I wanted to know what is uh, how we can determine uh, the structure of complex networks with the help of these new emerging tools. Uh, <clears throat> This uh, talk has three main parts, theoretical background, directed hypergraphs, and in the last uh, section, we will see some applications and we will see networks can be curved. Uh, but first, theoretical background. When we talk about, uh, when we talk about geometry, we know that uh, geometry is the science of a space. It's concerned with shapes, sizes, positions, and distances. Uh, when we talk about Riemannian manifolds, all of these manifolds are locally the same, but this resemblance is qualitative and not quantitative. Curvature is the fundamental geometric notion which help us to quantitatively differentiate between different types of the manifolds in the same dimension. Among different curvature notions, which are uh, defined in Riemannian geometry, Ricci curvature is the one which help us to quantitatively differentiate between different types of the manifold in the same dimension by comparing the average distance between two closed and holes with the distance between their centers. To be more precise, uh, please consider this middle image, which is a Euclidean plane, uh, we and we consider a point X uh, in this plane, and we consider a ball with radius epsilon and a tangent vector uh, uh, starting at Vx. So um, uh, this, this is a tangent vector at X, which I just uh, painted it here. Uh, and this uh, distance is delta, and y is at the end of delta v. Uh, so the distance between uh, x and y is delta. And if we use a parallel transport to move this blue ball around x with radius epsilon along this vector to uh, obtain a red ball around y, of course, with the same uh, radius, the theorem says that if epsilon and delta goes to zero, uh, the Ricci curvature at x along v is roughly this amount. So as we see in this formula, we are comparing the average distance between these two balls with the distance between their centers. So in Euclidean plane, uh, when the Ricci curvature is everywhere zero, that's along every tangent vector, uh, these balls are in exactly the same distance as their centers. On the other side, on a sphere, in the left diagram, the balls are closer than their centers in average because Ricci curvature uh, is positive at every point and along every vector. On the other side, in the right diagram, on a hyperbolic plane, balls are further compared to their centers because the Ricci curvature is negative everywhere. This is uh, one of our main keys that help us to uh, move our understanding and intuition of Ricci curvature uh, from uh, Riemannian uh, manifolds to more general settings. 
And do you mind if I ask a question? So the, the distance between balls, it's not the distance between the closest points, it's sort of an average distance, yes, is yes, that right? Exactly. So uh, we consider a point uh, in SX and we consider um, the image of that point under parallel transport. Ah, so basically I see. what we are doing here is uh, considering the sectional curvature. So we consider two geodesics in these two uh, balls and uh, I mean, two geodesics, which start from X and Y. And then we know what is the distance between the geodesics that give us the sectional curvature. And we know that the Ricci curvature is the average of sectional curvature when we um, consider this uh, second vector, um, which is uh, with radius epsilon, uh, move around the unit sphere uh, in the Tarjan space at X. So that is uh, the way that we get the average between all these points. Thanks. Sure. So uh, th that was our main uh, key and uh, to um, move our understanding of Ricci curvature notions to more general setting that Riemannian manifold. Before going to our desired uh, generalization of Ricci curvature, I should mention that mathematicians in the past 50 years have been interested in extending variety of curvature notions. Uh, when um, they are looking for some notions that uh, these notions are independent of infinitesimal properties such as continuity or differentiability, and or uh, they have some of analytical, geometrical, or topological properties of curvature bounds of Riemannian manifolds, and they can be applied to a wide range of examples and can be easily computed. These attempts have not been just limited to Ricci curvature, it's also for sectional curvature. For instance, Alexandrov uh, was among uh, the pioneer who uh, generalized sectional curvature notions to geodesic spaces. Also, a lot and Villani have been among uh, other mathematicians who generalize Ricci curvature notions to more general settings than Riemannian manifold. With these motivations, in 2007, uh, Olivier defined a notion of coerced Ricci curvature of Markov chains on metric measure spaces. So, what we need is uh, a metric space, uh, which is equipped with a random walk mu. So, a random walk is a set of probability measures which we can assign to each of the points in the space. Then, uh, by considering such kind of assumption, uh, we can define the Ricci curvature of uh, this uh, space in the direction of uh, every two points. Uh, to be uh, like uh, X and Y, where X and Y are distinct. Uh, curvature of XY is uh, defined to be one minus Wasserstein distance mu X mu Y over DXY, where uh, W1 is the uh, one Wasserstein distance between mu X and mu Y, and it is equal to the infimum of this integral when we consider epsilon to be uh, a coupling between uh, mu X and mu Y. There are different um, facts about this formula. The first thing is that we might ask why we consider one Wasserstein distance. Well, the answer is we can consider higher order Wasserstein distances, but to get similar results, uh, we need to put uh, usually uh, more restrictions on the space to get the same results. On the other side, uh, this, uh, based on Villani, this infimum for our metric measure space is always exists. So there is at least one coupling uh, which can, uh, gives us this infimum. For the previous case, uh, what I have seen is that at least um, people are um, uh, in different areas are either interested in one Wasserstein distance or uh, two Wasserstein distances. One Wasserstein distance is the easiest one to compute. And two Wasserstein distance is something that I have seen people in machine learning areas are specifically interested in because um, this is the one that uh, it's connected to Euclidean metric. And can I ask another question? So I'm familiar with the Wasserstein distance between measures. I was curious, how do you use this random walk mu to get the measures mu x and, and mu y? So it is, um, this is a very subtle question. So how uh, we can define uh, measures based on the random walks depends on the space. For um, 
Riemannian manifold, uh, we can talk about Riemannian value measure. So randomly jumping from a point to a um, ball, uh, to a sphere with radius epsilon. And uh, uh, this is actually the, uh, the part that I wanted to just say in the next slides. So um, um, as you see, this formula is very general. Uh, what we need is a, a metric space equal with a random one. This formula, uh, so this, uh, this spaces range from something uh, like a Riemannian manifold, uh, a smooth, completely smooth structure. And so when we uh, apply this formula to our uh, Riemannian manifold, uh, the interesting fact is that we get exactly this Ricci curvature that we had here up to this scaling factor. So as you see, that formula for the Olivier Ricci curvature is very similar to this formula. Uh, when we ignore this scaling factor and we substituted this average distance between the balls with the wattage time distance between probability measures. So if we apply Olivier Ricci curvature to our Riemannian manifold by considering Riemannian value measure, we get exactly this Ricci curvature up to this uh, scaling factor. And it is interesting to know that uh, well, uh, optimal transport and parallel transport, which is defined uh, in Riemannian geometry, have uh, this kind of connections. They are connected uh, by this uh, uh, factor that we have here. On the other side, in the opposite side of the range, uh, we can talk uh, about uh, for computing or defining Olivier Ricci curvature, we can talk about something like undirected graphs. So, in the undirected graphs, uh, for instance, we have such kind of undirected graph, and we want to define uh, the Ricci curvature along these two vertices x and y. Undirected graph is also a metric measure spaces uh, a space because we can just talk about. Uh, the metric to be uh, the combinatorial distance between the, every two vertex. And the measure uh, here is defined based on the random walks uh, starting from a vertex and going to the adjacent vertices. So because uh, these two vertex are connected uh, to uh, one edge here, we can just talk about the curvature of an edge instead of the uh, curvature of these two vertice vertices. Uh, when we are here, a random walker, which is at X, can uh, have uh, six vertices to go. Uh, and uh, when we, the undirected graph is unweighted, uh, we can um, go to each of these vertices with equal probability. I call the first measure masses. So one over six would be the size of each of these masses. And similarly, a random walker which starts at y have five vertices to go. And uh, when I call the second measure a hold, uh, one over five would be the size of each of these holes. And when we talk about optimal transport, uh, what we wanted to do was basically uh, minimizing this integral. Uh, minimizing this integral for minimizing this integral, what we need is that we want to see what are the shortcuts for moving masses to holes. The best, as you see, the maximum distance of each mass to each hole is at most three because the masses are the neighbors of X and the holes are neighbors of Y. The best type of shortcuts happens when a mass and hole coincide, something that happens in the triangles. When we have a triangle, including that mass and hole and the other uh, vertices that uh, we started our random walk. So uh, this is the best amount, of the, the best, uh, the best um, possible uh, case for uh, the shortcuts. Also, there is another type of shortcuts when we can move a mass to a hole uh, directly when their distance is one. Another type of shortcuts happen when we can move a mass to a hole uh, with distance two. And this happens when we have pentagons. The previous case uh, 
uh, happen when we have uh, quadriangle. And these are the uh, parameter of our theorem, which says, if mu i be the amount of mass that is moved with distance i, uh, where i is less equal than three in an optimal transport plan, then the curvature of this edge is mu zero minus mu two minus two mu three. And mu zero, as I said, is the amount of mass which is in the triangles. As you see, there is no mu one here, but computing mu one is uh, the intermediate step for computing mu two and mu three. Is there any question here? Um, I, I'm i saying one thing in the, ta in the chat, probably. No, nothing in the chat. Um, but I see how this is starting to answer my question about the random walk and where you get the measures from that. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So what are the implications of this formula? The first is that curvature is bounded curvature of an edge in the graph is bounded above by one and from below by minus two. One happens when we have, when mu zero is one and other mu's are zero. Also uh, minus two happens when all the mu's are zero except mu three, which is one. Also we can relate, uh, I think it is because of this one. We can relate uh, the local shape of graphs with the presence of triangles, quadriangles and pentagons. Also, if we consider one vertex here, any vertex in the graph, and we consider the curvature of all of the edges connecting to that uh, edge, uh, and we average over all the Ricci curvatures of that edge, we can uh, get a type of a scalar curvature of that at that point, which is controlled by the local clustering coefficient. As you know, local clustering coefficient is a very useful uh, measure in uh, network analysis and it is defined based on the number of triangles, including a vertex over the possible number of triangles, including that vertex. And in the local clustering coefficient, we just care about the triangles. But as you see here, we not only care about the triangles, but also uh, we care about quadriangles as pentagons because they are also another types of shortcuts for moving masses to holes. This is on directed graph case, uh, and uh, there are a lot of nice properties for the undirected graph case because we can define measures based on the random boxes starting from the points. But the point is, uh, many of the connections are not uh, undirected, they are directed, and uh, or we need to model higher order of interactions, something that happens in neural networks and chemical reaction networks. So uh, we need uh, to go to directed hypergraphs. And before going to the main uh, general, generalized version, directed hypergraphs, I should first uh, say something about directed graphs. When we talk about directed graphs, directed graphs are usually our complicated structures because we don't have a unique definition even for some of the most basic notions notions such as connected components. Because of this, there have been two main approaches for defining curvature and Laplacian notion for, uh, directed, uh, for directed graphs. The first approach is that we consider a strongly connected directed graphs. And uh, we consider all of the A's to have non-negative weights. Uh, the implications of this assumption is that the Perron measure, which is a stationary distribution of Markov chain exists, and consequently a, a type of symmetric and non-negative Laplacian can be defined. Also, many of analytic or geometric results can be extended to, uh, to directed settings with proofs uh, similar to their undirected counterparts. This is something that has been done a lot. Also, it has a lot of nice applications in network uh, theory, uh, but uh, most of the properties is also very, are uh, very theoretical. Uh, and specifically in the past few years, there have been a lot of nice results uh, on the connection of Ricci curvature and Laplacian on this setting. The second assumption is that the second approach is that we uh, don't consider any of the uh, above assumptions. So we don't consider a strongly connectedness. As you know, many of real networks are far from being strongly connected. 
uh, consider again neural networks or chemical reaction. The main motivation here is dealing with real world structures and developing useful tools for the analysis of complex networks. For Laplace and what has been done, or the main thing which, which was done is here uh, by Bauer. And uh, for uh, Kerwacher, uh, Richie Kerwacher notions, uh, this is what I'm gonna say in the next slide and not just for directed graphs but also for the general directed hypergraphs case and this is what we have done here uh, so a directed hypergraph uh, is a um, uh, includes a set of vertices v and hyper is e where roughly speaking, every hyper edge is a directional relation between two sets of vertices instead of two single vertex. So as a special case, a directed hyper edge uh, is a directed edge when A and B have two uh, single elements. Here I want to uh, compute the curvature of this green hyper edge. Uh, and then in the next slides, I will show what is the main formulation for computing uh, the curvature of hyperedge in directed hypergraphs. This green hyperedge E uh, connects set A in the left to set B in the right. Set A has three elements, set B has two elements. The, uh, the question is how we can define mu R and mu B. For defining the curvature, what we needed was uh, to define two probability measures. Set A has three elements. Uh, which the last one has no incoming hyperedge, and set B has two elements, which the, uh, the second one has no outgoing hyperedge. When we see the masses are uh, in the locations of the are located in the vertices, uh, which are in the tails of incoming hyperedge to set A, and holes uh, the measures assigned to B are in the headsets of outgoing hyperheads from B. Set A has a mass uh, with total size one, and uh, one of uh, over three of the mass is assigned to each of these, to, to each of these uh, vertices, because this vertex has no incoming hyperedge. We put its assigned mass at uh, this vertex itself. For this uh, vertex, it has one incoming hyperedge, so we uh, assign it to the tail set of incoming hyperedge to this vertex, which is one over three here. This vertex on the other side has two incoming hyperedges. So if we divide it equally to this uh, to, uh, to incoming to the tail sets of these two incoming hyperedge, one over six would be here. 1 over 12 would be here, and 1 over 12 would be here. On the other side, for uh, assigning measures to set B, we have a hole with total size 1. This vertex has no outgoing hyperedge, so 1 over 2 of the hole is assigned to this vertex itself. And the assigned uh, hole to this vertex is divided equally to the headset of the outgoing hyperedge from B. 1 over 4, 1 over 12, 1 over 12, 1 over 12. As you see, I define the masses and holes based on incoming hyperage to set A and outgoing hyperage from set B. But uh, the first question is that how, why we choose such kind of uh, option, why we um, this is our option here. Among all possible options of incoming, outgoing, 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 and all these directions, this is the only one that is guaranteed to have finite cost for the optimal uh, transport plan. Because the, as you see, again, the maximum distance of every mass and every hole is at most three. This is exactly the, thing, the same thing that happens in undirected graph case. If we consider other versions, because we don't consider a strongly connectedness, we are not sure that um, we can move masses to holes uh, with finite cost, because the distance between masses and holes could be infinite. Uh, we don't consider a strongly connectedness. 
So how, um, what is the size of these masses and holes? Uh, as I said, uh, we divide the masses equally uh, between uh, the incoming hyper H2 set A and we divide the uh, holes between outgoing hyper H from set B. So the curvature of this hyper edge K is mu zero, which is the mass, which, uh, um, which is the amount of mass with uh, and hole which coincide. This is something that happens in directed three cycles, as you see here. So a mu zero minus mu two minus two mu three was the formulation for the curvature of a hyper edge. Uh, is the uh, formulation for the curvature of a directed hyper edge as well, similar to the undirected, the edge uh, in the undirected graphs. So mu zero here is one over 12. What is mu two and mu one and mu three? Mu one is the amount of mass that uh, should be moved with distance one in an optimal plan. As you see, there is a mass here, which can be moved with distance one to this hole. So mu one is one over three. Mu two is the amount of mass that should be moved with distance two in an optimal plan. We have a, a remaining part of the hole, uh, one over two, which should be which which can be moved, which can be filled by a mass which is here. So one over six of the mass from here moves to here to fill uh, this hole. And mu three is the remains amount of mass uh, that should be moved with distance three. By computing this amount, one minus all above, oh, sorry. One minus all above, Oh, we get the curvature, which is minus 11 over 12, if we put all of this amount in this care, in this formula. So here uh, we saw that uh, how we compute the curvature of a, an edge, a hyper edge uh, in a directed hypergraph. What we did, we consider a directed hyper edge in a directed hypergraph from A to B. This hyper edge is from A to B, and the curvature uh, is defined one minus Wasserstein distance mu i in, mu b out, where mu i in and mu b out are two probability measures de defined on B as follows. Mu i in is the summation of mu x i in, where x i's are the elements in R, and uh, we put, we assigned, uh, we put one over n of the total mass uh, at xi itself when there was no incoming hyper to xi and we divided it equally to the tail sets of incoming hyper to xi when there was incoming hyper to xi and we didn't put any mass in other uh, vertices of the hypergraph. Similarly, uh, we defined uh, mu b out to be the summation of mu y j out where yj's are elements in B, and uh, we assign one over m of the whole uh, to yj itself when there was no outgoing hyper edge from yj, and we divided it equally to the headsets of uh, outgoing hyper edge uh, when there was outgoing hyper edge from uh, yj. And we didn't assign any whole to other vertices of the hypergraph. And then a Wasserstein distance between mu r in and mu p out is the minimum of this sigma, where uh, by this I mean uh, those elements which are in the support of r, uh, mu r in, and these are those elements which are uh, in the support of mu b out. And uh, this minimum, uh, this is taking, uh, this is taken over all the couplings between mu r in and mu b out. Namely, uh, in the last sentence, we are, uh, guarantees that uh, we are starting from all of, uh, from the masses and we fill all the holes. So, so far uh, we saw the formulation and definition of uh, Olivier Ritchie curvature for directed hypergraphs and there are some 
uh, interesting uh, properties for this definition. In some applications, we uh, want to know, for instance, uh, what, uh, how the curvature of a hyper edge changes when we remove some vertices of, of a hyper edge and we, or we add some vertices to the hyper edge. And uh, although the curvature deeply depends on uh, the connections between the masses and holes, at least we can give some bounds for these changes. The proposition says that if uh, we have a hyper edge from A to B with N and M elements, by adding L vertices to set A and L prime vertices to set B, we get a hyper edge E prime uh, in which the curvature of E prime and E, the difference between these two curvatures is bounded above by this number. On the other side, by removing L vertices from set A and L prime vertices from set B, uh, we get a hyper edge E prime, where uh, the difference between their curvatures in this case is bounded above by this number. On the other side, there is another interesting thing, uh, which is a usual framework for mathematicians, is that how we can classify the spaces uh, here, the hypergraphs, which have a constant Ricci curvature along all of the hyperids. This is something that uh, geometers do for different curvature notions, topologies do for the number of uh, uh, holes in different dimensions and so on. And this is what we are trying to do here. Uh, and there are three uh, different uh, main cases for hypergraphs here. The, uh, the uh, main cases are uh, Ricci one, uh, which is the highest amount of curvature in the sense of Olivia. Uh, Ricci flat, which means that all the hyperis have curvature zero and Ricci minus two. Here I just mentioned the Ricci one case, but uh, we have similar results for Ricci flat and Ricci minus two. The theorem says that vertices of a Ricci one directed loopless hypergraph such that every hyper edge uh, do not have a hyper edge in the re reverse direction can be divided into three sets as following, where uh, we have a partitioning from set A to set B, uh, from set B to set uh, C and C to A. These arrows basically means that we have a color, these arrows represent a collection of directed hyperis from set A to set B and so on. What about the reverse? When, because when we talk about classification, we, we want to know both directions. The reverse is true uh, for directed loopless graphs, not general directed hypergraphs. But this reverse also helps us to get closer uh, even to, to the classification, uh, even for the general directed hypergraphs by considering the corresponding directed graph of a directed hypergraph. So, so far we saw some uh, theoretical uh, results. And in this part, uh, we will see some applications and we will see networks can be curved. Uh, before going to the network analysis, I should mention about uh, the background in network analysis theory too. Uh, in this, uh, in the network analysis, we have two main approaches as well. Traditional VS model. In the traditional analysis, we model complex networks by directed or undirected graphs. And we use vertex-based measures to determine the structure, uh, local and global. Uh, measures such as node degree and local clustering coefficient. But in the modern analysis, we take higher in, uh, order interaction into accounts based on mod modeling by directed or undirected hypergraphs and simplicial complexes. And we develop hyperedge or simplex based measures by the help of ideas originated from Riemannian smooth settings for prohibiting local or global structures, measures such as Ricci curvature. And this second approach is the one that we have taken in the Institute and with my colleagues. Uh, and uh, I will talk about in next slide. 
But why Richie Caravature? Why Richie Caravature is a um, powerful and interesting tool for analyzing complex networks? The first is uh, we can identify connectivity patterns and motifs by the help of these two complementary Ricci curvature tools, Olivier and Foreman. Uh, the, alongside Olivier Ricci curvature, there was something else, uh, another type of Ricci curvature uh, defined originally uh, on cell complexes by Foreman, which comes from totally another ideas uh, from Riemannian geometry. And uh, here, uh, my colleague uh, uh, have uh, developed it to hypergraphs and directed hypergraphs. And for a directed hyper edge, uh, this is one of the, the definitions that we have that a form and Ricci curvature of a directed hyper edge is defined to be uh, the total size of head and tail of the hyper edge minus the sigma in degree of the elements in A uh, minus sigma. Uh, out degree of the elements of uh, B. And uh, here in this diagram, first of all, when you see this formula, it is much more, uh, much simpler than what we had for Olivier, but it cannot capture what Olivier's can, specifically in undirected graph setting. Uh, Olivier is much more interesting because of the, the deep connection between Olivier Ricci curvature, Laplacian, and a stochastic process. But here in this diagram, we see that when we want to compute the curvature of this orange hyper edge, we see that when we go from left to right, uh, the curvature of Olivier is changed. The sign of Olivier is changed while the, the sign of Foreman is fixed. Um, this is because we are basically killing the shortcuts uh, for moving masses to holes when we go from left to right. On the other side, when we go from up to down, the sign of Olivier is fixed, but uh, the sign of Foreman is changed. In the diagonal, uh, the sign of both is fixed. Needless to say that uh, um, identifying connectivity patterns and motifs in uh, uh, complex networks is a very essential task, especially when they are uh, modeled by directed hypergraph, this is a very non-trivial uh, task. On the other side, we can talk about uh, another complicated structures, which are uh, basically hyperloops. What are the hyperloops in directed hypergraphs? A hyperloop is a directed hyperedge in which the tail and head have non-empty intersection. This is something which is uh, which is happening a lot in some real networks such as chemical reaction network. In a chemical reaction network, when we present uh, reactions by directed hyperedge, a catalysor uh, in a hyper, uh, in a reaction is something which is used in a reaction and it is produced in a reaction. So it is in the intersection of tail and head of the reaction. So, um, but people, people usually ignore this structure because of complete, because they are complicated in di different areas. They just ignore uh, about the presence of hyperloops. But here, uh, this is something that Olivier and Foreman can somehow uh, easily do uh, analyzing the structures of hyperloops. So when we move down in the columns, both uh, Foreman and Olivier decreases but by moving horizontally, we see that Foreman increases while Olivier decreases. In this diagram, we see different types of intersection of uh, tail and head. In the right column, they have uh, just a non-empty intersection, but in the left column, um, head and tail are coincide, um, head and tail coincide. And these are the situation that could happen uh, to make a hyperloop. But some uh, real network analysis. Uh, another uh, important uh, reason that why Ricci curvature is, is a good and powerful tool for analyzing complex networks is that it can detect local or global important structures such as cl a clustering, a sparsity, bottleneck, or redundant reactions. Here, what uh, we have is a metabolic network of E. coli. 
which has uh, 102,000 reactions almost and 680 reactants. So uh, by reaction, I mean every reaction is a hyperedge from set A to set B. And just uh, recall again that we consider uh, the incoming hyperedge to set A and outgoing hyperedge from set B. In the diagram R, we see that uh, uh, this uh, number is the number of reactions ha which has that number of elements in the tail and heads of the hyperedge. We see that 49, uh, 492 of the reactions have uh, two elements in their headset, in their tail sets, and two elements in their headset. Also, 90% of the reaction that you see has three elements in their headset and three elements in their tail set. On the other side, when we talk about Foreman Ricci curvature, when we see the distribution of Foreman Ricci curvature, this curvature is very negative uh, for most of the reactions. And um, just recall again um, the, the definition of Foreman. The definition of Foreman of, uh, of, a, of an edge was the total size of head and tail minus the sigma in degree uh, of the elements in A minus a sigma, the out degree of the elements of B. When we have this number of very negative, uh, this very negative amounts, by comparing it with the first diagram, we saw that most of the reaction, 90% of the reaction has at mo have at most six elements in both head and tail. But very uh, negative numbers come from the fact that most of the reactions have a lot of incoming hyperage to set A and a lot of outgoing hyperage from set B. And the most negative amounts basically represent those hyperage uh, or reactions which are uh, bottleneck in the networks because they are uh, connected in the left from so many reactions and in the right to so many reactions. Uh, on the other side, uh, we see here in the third diagram, uh, the distribution of masses and holes here. Also, uh, the size of these balls is correlated uh, with the number of reactions. As you see, most of uh, many of the reactions, uh, this, bigger, uh, this uh, bigger ball, most of the reactions uh, have um, like this number of masses among around 700 number of masses and uh, this number of holes. We, uh, how we uh, assign a mass? We assign the masses to the tail set of incoming hyperage to A and outgoing, um, we assign the holes to the outgoing hyperage from B. And when we have this very high number of masses and holes, basically uh, what it means is that these hyperage are very much connected to the whole, uh, to a very huge part of the networks. On the other side, uh, when we see the last diagram, uh, Olivier Ricci curvature, uh, the distribution of the Olivier Ricci curvature, we see that uh, most of the curvature have curvature around zero. Uh, and it means that from this, uh, uh, from most of the masses, we have a direct pass to most of the holes because uh, th that is the one uh, which uh, gives us the curvature zero. And just four of the reactions have the most negative amounts, uh, which is minus two. So just for, uh, for just four of the reactions, uh, we should move the masses to holes uh, with distance three. But for most of the reactions, and that's not the case. And we have uh, very good shortcuts mo for moving masses to holes. And basically, this is something that quantifies the topological overlap between incoming neighbors, incoming neighbors to A and outgoing neighbors of B and it quanti quantifies the clustering. So this biological network is very clustered because of uh, this huge number of masses and holes and uh, a curvature around zero uh, for most of the reaction. As the last case, uh, we can talk about uh, the difference 
between uh, random networks, uh, randomly generated networks and real networks. This is also a very usual paradigm in complex network analysis when we compare our network with a randomly generated one. And the most interesting case happened when um, our uh, randomly generated models are very much close to our real network. This is something that can be done uh, by uh, shuffling of a, our network, shuffling the hyper edge, shuffling of the hyperis of our real networks. What do I mean by shuffling is that uh, consider we have a network uh, which has two edge. And shuffling of these networks means that I, I is connected to B prime and uh, R prime is connected to B. This means shuffling of the hyperage in these networks. In the shuffling process, degree sequence and size of hyperage, both head and tails are stable. It's exactly like what we had in the, our real network. But the point is, although uh, degree sequence and size of hyperage is stable. Olivier and Foreman Ricci Kerwacher are changing in our network. And this is something that is showing in uh, these diagrams when in the left diagrams, uh, we have the uh, distribution of our metabolic network. Uh, and in the right, uh, we have the uh, distribution of the Kerwacher for the shuffled case. So as you see, these two are obviously different and um, namely, uh, Olivier and Foreman Richie Kervacher can detect the shuffling of the uh, network, uh, sh shuffling of the connections in our network. As the conclusion, uh, we, we know that many empirical networks incorporate higher order relations between elements. Olivier Richie Kervacher of directed hypergraphs is defined based on voltage and distance between measures assigned to sets of vertices of a hypergraph. And we can characterize various classes of hypergraphs with constant curvature, specifically minus two, zero, and one. Olivia Ricci curvature, uh, Olivia and Foreman Ricci curvatures are complementary tools for identifying motifs and analyzing the structure of hyperloops. And distributions of these curvatures for real networks, such as metabolic network of E. coli, deviates from random models. And they nicely detect redundant or bottleneck hyperage uh, reactions in the metabolic case, and also quantify clustering and topological overlap between neighboring sets. So thank you very much for your listening, and I would be happy to answer questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marcia. So before we get to questions, let's briefly unmute ourselves and applaud for the speaker. All right. And we have time so for questions. So any questions? I'll get started with the first question. So, you know, when um, when a geometer looks at a point on a manifold, you know, you have good intuition and you can identify this as a negatively or positively curved point. Um, uh, how would you say that situation is for graphs? You know, as experts build their, their intuition, can they look at edges and start to end up identify these bottleneck edges as negatively curved or things like this? Mm. Uh, I don't know how uh, precise they should look at the structure to understand whether the curvature is positive or negative and so on. But uh, this is really, really interesting question because uh, at least what I understand is that when we talk about curvature um, generalizations to more general settings than Riemannian manifold, as I said, one main thing is that uh, what are the properties is that uh, curvature bounds uh, ha uh, have uh, in Riemannian case. For instance, when we talk about uh, positive lower bound in Ricci curvature, we have bonnet mayer theorem. So if the Ricci curvature of the space is bounded from below by a positive number for every two points, 
uh, the diameter of the space is finite. Okay, so um, in the graph case, of course, it is a discrete setting. Uh, we could probably say something about the curvature of the edge by seeing the triangles, quadriangles, and pentagons. So if we have a lot of triangles, it is highly likely uh, its curvature is highly likely positive. Or when we have a lot of quadrangles, it's highly likely around zero. Okay, but the thing is, um, in directed case, we cannot say something like that. Of course, you know it's it's not that and that uh, uh, that's uh, obvious. What is the meaning of positive curvature or negative curvature or zero curvature in more general setting? But something which has a meaning in more general setting is the connections of curvature to other notions which are already there. For instance, when we talk about, as I said, for positive curvature in Riemannian manifold, we had we have bonnet mayer theorem. Also for uh, graph case, uh, we have that uh, theorem when we have uh, 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 the curvature of the graph is bounded from below by a positive number, it means that the diameter of the space is finite uh, for the graph case as well. Or other uh, properties as well, like um, what is the connection to uh, the first non-zero eigenvalue of the Laplacian? Uh, this is something uh, that also has uh, originated from Riemannian geometry. So if we have a lower positive bound for the curvature in Riemannian geometry, lambda one is bigger equal than that lower positive bound. And this is something that is also transferred uh, to the under graph setting when we define uh, the Laplacian, normalized Laplacian, uh, which is a very usual notion in under graph case and the uh, lambda one is bounded below or by uh, the lower positive bound for the curvature in undirected graph case. So uh, how much these notions have been successful? I think it's also not about the shape of the space, but it's also about the connections of curvature with Laplacian, with the stochastic process and so on, which some of them has been transferred by different notions of curvature from Riemannian geometry to more general settings. That's beautiful. So there's a uh, question in the chat window from Alex Smith and uh, they ask, can you speak more on how you detect bottlenecks or redundant edges in these hypergraphs? Is it directly given by the curvature of the given hyper edge? Okay. So uh, we had that one here, I think. So as I said, um, here in the second diagram, we see uh, all of the reactions have uh, uh, very negative amounts in the sense of format, okay? When, uh, and the most uh, negative amounts, uh, there are some edges which gets these most negative amounts. But what, is it, what does it mean to get most negative amounts in the, in the, in the uh, hyper graph? So we have, an edge uh, which gets the most negative amounts for the curvature. Uh, it happens when uh, that edge, which its total, uh, which the total size of its head and tail is at most six, is connected from left to so many hyper edge and connected from right to so many hyper edge like this. So this, the most negative amounts for the curvature uh, the edges which most with most negative amounts for the curvature are the ones which are essential for the flows in the networks because most of the flows comes to the they, uh, those edges and goes out from those edges from the other side. So these are the bottlenecks in the network. But how these things are connected? I mean, what is the I mean, we are talking about um, coming to set A and going out from set B. But how much these things are connected is, uh, and how clustered is the network is represented and is quantified by Olivier. When we talk about how uh, much is the overlap between these two measures. And as we see in the last diagram, uh, most of the reactions have uh, curvature around zero and positive. 
and just four of the reactions uh, have curvature minus two, which means that uh, these um, measures, uh, these two measures, uh, mass and, and holes have a very high amount of overlap, uh, or uh, we can move masses to holes with distance at most one in most of the reactions. So they are not completely far from each other, but uh, they are really connected by one directed edge, um, directed hyper edge, most of the masses to most of the holes. More questions? All right. Well, if not, thank you so much, uh, Marcier, for the fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is my pleasure.